Minas san konnichiwa and welcome to the board game dojo where we use communication to learn more about board games and the people who translate them. I am so excited to have on today Keita or Francis, which I think you're going to go by Francis today, right? Mhm. Mm that's that's me. Or Takino san. That's also me. Yeah. That is. Um and he has translated games for Arc Light such as Anno 1800. He's worked on the Clank games as well as Yukon Airways. And I think more importantly, he is the co-founder of the board game Dojo. In fact, the idea of using science and history to learn more about board games was his idea. So Francis, thank you so much for coming on. And I'm sure the audience appreciates it too, because they don't just have to listen to me and look at me. They can see your beautiful face. No, no. thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm sure you're quite popular as well. Well, I'm going to start this off right away because I know that it is it is 9 a.m. here, but it is 10 p.m. for you there, so might be just about bedtime for you, no, you old man. No, just No, no. no. <laughs> well, our, my first question would be, mm -hmm. uh, what is? How did you get into board gaming in the first place? What is your board game origin story, if you will? Right. So it started out as a couple's thing. My girlfriend then and I were exploring, you know, how to spend our pastime. You know, when we're just relaxing at home what else can we do besides watch tv or movies and then like so we got the idea of playing something so we we were first playing othello but as mm -hmm. you know in you know a perfectly symmetrical abstract game like that the difference in skill level will always show so i kept losing you know i, <laughs> I, I was i was enjoying the time we spent playing a game but I started to feel quite helpless at the same time. So I think one day, just walking out on the street or on the train, I kind of remember hearing that board gaming was starting to become a thing in Tokyo. So I started to think, I was like, oh, Othello is a board game. What I wonder what else there are. So I started doing my research and I was like, wow, there are so many games out there. So after about a few days or maybe a week, or so in the research, you know, watching the YouTube videos, and reading articles, the first game I decided to buy was Corridor, uh, which is also a symmetrical oh. abstract game. Do you, do you know that, that one? Yeah, it's the one. It's like spelled like Q U O R. That one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. So yeah, it, which is also a symmetrical abstract game, and this time I was the I I was the one that always wins the the one. So, and then I started to, it's, it's a game where we try to advance our pawns to the other side of the board. And while setting up barricades to block the opponent's path. So it's a very, very uh, tight cutthroat game, as you might imagine. But then I'm, you know, I kept winning and I, so I started to feel sorry because, you know, your one wall can completely destroy your opponent's hard work sure. that they built. So. I kind of started to feel bad. So we stopped playing that after a while. And then I started going to board game cafes. And this was in 2019 before COVID. So it was pretty easy to, you know, get out, you know, grab your friends to the board game cafes. So it was a fun time discovering lots of new games. You know, the good things, the good thing about board game cafes is that you don't really have to know any games. You can just walk in. You know, pick a game by the cover, you know, if they look appealing. And then usually the shopkeeper knows how to play the game. So you just have to sit and listen and start playing. And then you get a pretty good sense of what the game's like. So I was doing that for a while. And then, so the first few years I started getting to board games, I was al always looking into games, like buying a lot of games every month, inviting friends over to, you know, host board game nights and days. Then I started to realize that the rate I buy the games was way faster than the rate I play them. And Oof, I, that yeah. hits home. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. wallowing in my 200 plus board game collection that's sitting up there. So oh, lots yeah. of them in shrink. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was about the time when I met you. And then, you know, I was soon running out of storage. So I did settle down after a while. Yeah. COVID slowed everything down. But yeah, so yeah, that's how I got into board game. So kind of going going back there a second, is Othello pretty common as a way for people in Japan to get into board gaming? Kind of like 
checkers would be here or something mm -hmm. that kind of lots of houses just have a copy of Othello or mm -hmm. not really? Oh, I think it's a pretty popular game, you know, and a household game. But I, I don't know if uh, it's a common progression to go from Othello to other board games. But yeah, okay, it could happen. I, I think the more natural path would be, you know, to have like a Monopoly or the Game of Life. Mm -hmm. And that could like advance into Catan. And yeah. Sure. So actually, maybe the checkers comparison is pretty right on because I think a lot of people know how to play, they just, but they don't necessarily go straight into hobbyist board gaming. Mm -hmm. And yep. yeah, the Board Game Cafe has really started to pick up in the last few years mm -hmm. in, in Tokyo specifically with Jelly Jelly Cafe opening a bunch of right, new branches right. and stuff. I've even seen yep. like little ones with like middle of nowhere neighborhoods, but they have a board game cafe just in somebody's oh, yeah. house. Like, all right. I went to yeah. one that was literally, I think the the size of your apartment big. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. It had like a hundred some board games in there. It's like, wow. But mm -hmm. how did, so I guess there's still a lot of people who go into hobbyist gaming, but there's not a whole lot of people who go from there and turn it into a job. How did you go right. from just enjoying board games mm -hmm and building up a collection to actually working in translation work and bringing these foreign games to Japan. Sure. Well, it was just a short, short term thing. And I just happened to walk into it by chance. Um, I used to work in a translations company before and one of my colleagues then, um, her brother worked for Arclight, you know, which is one of the major board game publishers in Japan. So my colleague would be helping out doing the translations for them from time to time. And one day she inter introduced me to, you know, Arclight. So I was able to translate a couple of games for them. And yeah, the first one was Yukon Airways. And then I did a couple after that. So hmm. I guess for me, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't really know a lot about the translation work to me. I, I just imagine them like just sending you a PDF of the, mm -hmm rules and then just saying like, okay, go do this for us. But what is the process of them finding a game and then getting it to you and then you working with them and then getting it out? Mm -hmm. What does that kind of process for you look like? Um, so yeah, they'll first approach me. They, they'll tell me that they want to get this game translated. And then they will send me the actual copy in the original language. In mo most cases, they, they would send me some PDF booklets for the rule book etc and then I, i'll try to figure the game out um ideal in an ideal world i will get to play actually play the game with my friends you know so i i know how it works but e even if i couldn't do that i'll just have to really you know set the game on my own and then i will work, work from there I was going to say, if you can't even play the game first, that has to be really hard to like visualize. Oh, it, is. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. is I, I didn't really think about that being a difficulty. Is there another difficulty that you can think of that maybe people don't think about like with translating mm -hmm. or translation work? Oh, I guess this could be a, just a general thing about translations is that whenever people play translated games, they might not realize that the rule books or the rules themselves could be quite, you know, obscure, even in the original language. Mm -hmm. So when, when that obscurity remains in the translations, you know, they naturally would be quick to blame it on the translations. But, um, I mean, there certainly are mistranslations all the time, but setting that aside, you know, while I do believe that translators should stick to the original text as much as possible but you know, when when the original texts are not quite straightforward we we do need to inter make interpretations and try to make it easier to understand as much as possible yeah i was going to say we in the last interview was talking about uh with Ryan Campbell of PGC was talking a lot about that, like small card games specifically are very important to make sure that you get each rule completely right. But you do mm -hmm. a lot of the bigger games that are like Clank that has lots and lots and lots of rules spread spread over oh, yeah. pages. Mm -hmm. I guess what what do you do? What happens if you come across a rule that is a bit obscure? What is you said you try to stick to the text as much as possible? Mm -hmm. What is your um 
like how do you deal with a rule book that I'm not saying Clank is one of them, but mm-hmm. how do you deal with a rule book that maybe isn't good? What is your system of figuring it out and what solution mm-hmm. do you usually come up with? Oh, oh, fortunately, the games I had to trans- I, I translated, they were, you know, they were all published elsewhere. So, you know, if they're usually I could find some Q&A on BGG or anything. I think that usually the people people get stuck in like similar parts. So I would able to find what they would be saying. And a lot of the times the board game designers would be actually doing the answering as well. So that helped for sure. So are you able then to put your the like FAQ maybe stuff yeah. inside the normal print, like as a as an addendum mm-hmm. in the rule book itself? Or is it do you just write them into the rules so that the Japanese just says that rule that maybe that clarifying point just straight in the rule book itself? Or do you leave it as is and then mm-hmm. maybe direct people, okay, this is where the FAQ is? Um so yeah, if there are confusing parts, we, uh, our client, and you know, I certainly try to direct, you know, direct the games so that the direct the rule book so it will be clear. So in those parts, you know, we'd be quite liberal you know, to make huh. it a bit yeah you know, easy to understand. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Let's say that ArcLight, they said, okay, we're going to pay you your normal rate. You can bring any game. Mm-hmm. in the world to Japan and do the translation for it and we'll publish it. What mm-hmm. game would you want to see get brought? Um okay so yeah. I'm trying to think um I think we get a fair amount of hot games published in Japan but I um some of the Lacerda games I think we only have had like 3 Lacerda games translated into Japan and hopefully I I get the trend going going because that would be a really uh big challenge but yeah that w- sort of games yeah oh man i'm just like trying to envision those i, I think i've seen on mars there yeah on mars yes from arc light yeah i'm not say, sure yeah, but, yeah. Those you guys. i'm not sure but i think they they also have a kickstarter um a bit addition kickstarter that has a Japanese option for Lisboa and uh, maybe it was Kanban. I think one, yeah, Lisboa and one more. I am actually very surprised to hear you say that. I did not think that like the Lacerdas was were gonna be like up mm-hmm. your alley because you know like we we game together a lot, Francis and yeah. I. Know a lot of your you've got a lot of the dusty euros we'll call them oh, yeah. <laughs> on your shelf. Uh, wasn't really expecting that <laughs> and kind of talking about that. So kind of mm-hmm. stepping away from translation work a little bit, but you know, this is another question that I like to ask people are what are five games that you just can't live without? Like five games that you mm-hmm. are, you could just play for the rest of your life. If you only had five games, what would they be? Um. So yeah, my first pick would be Le, Le Havre, Le Havre by Uwe Rosenberg. French accent uh, was killer. Yeah. Nailed it. Le Havre. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I just find the flow of the game pretty, you know, it's really soothing. It's quite smooth. You know, you only basically have two actions, but with those two actions, there's so many things you can do. And, you know, it's always, it's an engine building and it keeps building. It's not really tight as well. So it's quite fun. I, I like the whole theme as well. And of course, I like the artwork by Clemens Franz. So, yeah. Okay. Kind of okay. Pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Can't say I agree, pictures. but yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, that would be my first pick. The second pick for two player games would be probably Targi. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed that as well. With the expansion or without the expansion? I'll let you have the expansion if you want. Um, I actually haven't played the expansion yet. So yeah, so far just the base game's good. Okay. Yeah. That's a good pick. That's a solid pick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was yeah, my slot for two player games. Okay. Oh, you're and categorizing then, uh, them. Oh yeah, yeah. So the yeah, the bigger game, two player game. Yeah. I I I was kind of debating between Targi or Innovation. Well, Innovation's not a two player game, but I think it's 
quite it's a two player game uh, yeah chaotic it's a two player game yeah yeah but yeah how about your third um from the third my third to fifth games would be for my more of the lighter kind of game game party day kind of things the first one will be skull king skull king is a quite you know it could get raucous an exciting trick taking game. Uh, I like trick t- t- trick taking games. I yeah, you're actually the one that introduced me enough. to trick taking. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, pleasure. Yeah. What was the first trick taking game that I introduced you to? I think it was Skull King actually. And then, because we played oh, Skull King at uh at a meetup, mm-hmm. and then later we played the crew at your place. With the right. third person. I think it might have been Yoshi at that point. Maybe, maybe. And so th- those were the first trick takers that I had ever played. Mm-hmm. For those two. Okay. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting how, you know, they come up with all these variations with just a simple set of base rules. Yeah, I think I think Skull King like was kind of this cool moment for me because it was like, oh, there's like this card where you we were betting on how many times you could win. Mm. And that idea that just kind of blew my mind. And then the oh, next yeah. one you showed me was the crew, which mm. I mean at that point I'd kind of oh. not known how like how much trick taking. Like I kind of thought the crew it's almost like an unfair mm-hmm. uh introduction into trick taking because it's such a novel idea. That how right. you know however long trick taking has been in that suddenly there's this cooperative version mm-hmm. of it. I'm like, wow, it's okay. So this is the innovation that's happening in trick taking, and then you oh, go right. out and you're like, okay, now I gotta find like all these other games that do something kind of unique and clever. Oh, yeah. it's an addiction. Mm-hmm. Okay, sorry, but I interrupted. What's your yeah, number four? No um, going down a similar alley for party games. Um, the one called Your Bluffing. Oh, we played this one, didn't we? Uh, have we? It's a it's a game that we auction or auction cattle. Yes, I was gonna say this is yeah. the cows one, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's I think we good. actually talked about it on the. I think I actually talked about it on the, one of the podcast episodes. Actually, I'll okay. if if I did, I will put the link in the description right. below so that those who are watching and listening can go back to that episode. Yeah. And number five. Um, uh, modern art. By Reiner Knizia. Oh. Now, which version? You like the Oink version best, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I played the Oink version. The card is that the your artwork favorite? is really good. Is that your favorite version? Um, for now, I think yeah. I think there was a Korean edition with actual paintings like Klimt and those kinds. I'd be interested in that one as well. I love how you're accidentally like plugging a video that I just uh, that at the time of recording just came out. This this. Uh, mm-hmm. This episode won't come out until April, but literally this week, I or yesterday, just published mm-hmm. a video in which the like I did like the top ten imports, and number nine was modern art, and it was the only good version and the Korean oh, okay. version. So it's oh, like okay. yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a little happy accident. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> okay, so think... to, to review, you said Le Havre. I'm not going to mm-hmm. try doing your French pronunciation because that was too good. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it was Le Havre. It was. Yep. I'm I'm not going in any. Let's see, Le Havre. Targi, mm-hmm. and then you had Skull King, right? Then your bluffing and mm-hmm. modern art. Those mm-hmm. would be the five games for you. Yeah, I think it's a well balanced diet. <laughs> yeah, I'll be so proud. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I actually only have one more question for you, mm-hmm. and that is for people who are getting into translation work. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have any tips for them? Because it seems like mm-hmm. a lot of uh, I guess not only are foreign games getting brought to Japan, but now a lot mm-hmm. of Japanese games are getting brought mm-hmm. here as well. Oh, Do you have any tips right. for people who want to yeah, get into so, it? Or yeah, so, yeah, my tip would my. I mean, I just happened to get into translation by chance, but you know, translation is quite a saturated market. So I think the most important thing is for you to get to know people that are in the industry. So, you know, go meet people in conventions, you meet the publishers. And I think, you know, that's your way to get the, uh, get jobs. 
or meet other you know people doing translations. So yeah, making connections, meeting people, I think that would be crucial. Hmm. That's a good one. And it's kind of a random question. What happens if you get like a joke in the rule book? Like I know some oh, rule books yeah. try to be funny and oh, that's really will try hard. to be quirky. What like but some of them I don't try. translate well. No, no, they don't. So yeah, I mean when I was doing Clank, they they'd have a flavor text on the bottom of the cards. So yeah. The hose were really hard what do you yeah, do I what did you do best. in this situation did you try to do as like a straight just like a straight translation of it or are you do you try to make us kind of similar mm -hmm. joke but kind of adjusting it for japanese culture so it makes sense yeah i, I try to take the latter approach try to find the equivalent in japanese like similar joke as much as possible yeah that was really hard because i have to come think of jokes you know from out of oh, yeah, that's got to be hard for you. Yeah. That's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you think of one just off the top of your head that you had? To... Do you remember any of them that you had to do? Uh, I was doing, you know, I forgot which expansion or if it was Clank in Space, but they play, they do a lot of word, word games because they have a lot of animals in that game, right? Like monkeys and okay, I forgot, tigers or cats. And like the char character's name will be something similar to the animal that they're, they're trying to depict. Um, I don't know, like some ape something, or it, it's a robot's name, but you, you can clearly tell that the robot's name is similar to something like monkey or ape or something like that. So those, like, like yeah, translating the names of cards were pretty hard as well. It's like there's like an, it, there's already a joke in, in the card's names. So yeah, trying to get that through was pretty hard. So yeah, then again, so do you like just do it in katakana, the which is how like the Japanese language mm -hmm. uses does writes uh foreign yeah, yeah. words that they keep, mm -hmm. or do you change it so like maybe the like we'll say the monkey robot is saru. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I would probably change it like saru botto or something like that. Saru is monkey. Yep, yep. For those watching. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't make it into like monkey botto or anything. I'll change. Yeah, that's Saru. what I was more wondering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, what else are you up to nowadays with with gaming? You still going to meetups now that like COVID is lifted? Because I think Japan was really strict with, uh, mm -hmm. has really st still kind of strict. I think they just made masks optional like recently. Oh yeah, yeah. Like two days um, ago, literally. Yeah. So how has gaming been going? Are things starting to open up? Are meetups starting to become more of a thing again? Well, um, I don't know. Not as much as before yet. But the board game cafes, they were still open. So I would try to visit, you know, go to them from time to time. But yeah, I haven't been able to do much gaming recently. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us today. And thank you, audience, for listening or watching, however you're doing this. And if you're not subscribed to the podcast or the YouTube, what are you doing? You just go to subscribe to both. We have good content on both. We have reviews on YouTube and we have long form podcasts. Sometimes there'll be board game reviews. Sometimes we go into science and history of board games. Uh, go, go check it out and like and subscribe if that's your thing. And Francis, arigatou gozaimashita. Hontani, hontani arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you for joining us today. And to all of you, until next time, janne.